welcome back to How It's Done. We are doing a follow-up today on the Restored Church of God and Worldwide Church of God series that we've been doing with Mark and Dennis again. We thought we'd go over some more questions, uh, get some more answers for you and some clarification. Thank you guys for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Well, good afternoon for some of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> Should I mention it's 65 degrees in Portland? <laughs> yes, Dennis is, is far on the other side of the country. Yes. Dennis, how did you end up all the way in Portland? You don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here three times. I've had three trips back here to finally realize this is where I belong. Um, I'm curing my bad habit of following other people's dreams. Well, so, the pictures you show, it's beautiful there. Oh, it's amazing. I can go down the street and there's Mount Hood with snow and Mount St. Helens to the north. On a clear day, I can see Mount Rainier up in Seattle. Oh, wow. That must be awesome. It to is. Live by. And of course, we've got the Willamette River goes through town and the Columbia is just to the north. So, yeah, it's, it's a kind of a magic place. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us again. Um, so we're going to go kind of like where we left off and and get some more for the users. Um, you left RCG in March of 2021, Mark. Yes. How are you today? Basically a little over a year. Well, it's been a, I would call it a, a, a tough transition. It has not been smooth. It's not all uh, rainbows and ponies for me since then. I'm currently uh, unemployed. I did have a job. I got another job from July of 2021 until my last paycheck was around March of this year. And it's been a really interesting struggle because, you know, when you're in the church of God, you're given God's blessings because you're obeying him and serving him. And so we've been often told that, you know, people are going to go back out in the world and they're kind of turning their back on God. So of course he has to turn their blessings you know, turn his back on their blessings. And so I knew that when I was leaving, that I was taking the risk that, you know, I could walk across the street and get struck by a bus. I could get struck by lightning. It's like one of those things that you can joke about, but also is very serious because there are biblical imp implications for leaving. Overall, I would say I'm doing okay. I've had people reach out and see, you know, check in on me and see how I'm doing. I'm okay right now. I'm not depressed. It's still stressful to not be working, but it's also stressful to not be where I devoted my life for almost nine years and not quite know where things are leading. And it also happened during the time basically of, of COVID really is, you know, right after that and, and the job market and everything. So Unfortunately, you know, when you decided to leave, it happened to be during, you know, all this time, but um, I know you'll find something. You, you're, tell everybody what you do. You're extremely talented. I'm a video editor and videographer um, by trade. I'm willing to do other things, but I have a production experience that goes back 30 years where I worked in film and television. So I have an extensive um, breadth of experience. The Northeastern Ohio area is not the largest market in the world, but Cleveland does have a lot of production in Akron as well. So, you know, something will happen or I'll find a job and just move out of state. <laughs> Dennis, how has it been for you since you've been out? And you've been out quite a while. Yeah, it's been 25 years. I've, um, I'm doing fine. It's been a, a tough road to hoe. Um, I have a, um, my therapeutic massage practice for 25 years. I'm booked you know, consistently a month ahead, five, six clients a day. I'm still working. I like the work. So but that's going really well. Um, the transition, you know, was very emotional. I think we talked about that before. Uh, actually, it was chaotic. Um, uh, I went through a lot, as Mark mentioned, uh, you go through a certain amount of depression, which for me was um, simply um, anger repressed anger that uh, I didn't feel I could express safely or uh, the price of doing it was too high. But that's just in your head. And then, of course, I went through the, yeah, I'll take this medication and that one. And it's very common, very typical. Got a lot of counseling to try to tell the story and get it off my head. Um, 
but I'm doing doing fine uh, overall. I had entered in and I got divorced during that time. I have told you before I accept responsibility for that. Um, I'm pretty open about the experience because my approach is if you're going to have an experience, you might as well share it because a lot of people have the same experience, but they're afraid to share it. I've never been afraid to share it. I've always used my real name and my real experiences, and I really was a pastor. I don't hide behind anonymity. Um, but uh, during that transition, I, uh, I drank too much. I didn't grow up with that, but I drank too much. So I went through the, okay, stop that. That doesn't help. Um, I'd entered into a, an, a, a good relationship, but because of the stress and because of issues that I had unresolved, um, that was a really bad environment to think something was going to thrive. And so that, that came unglued. And I'm just by myself at this point in life and uh, probably uh, slide into home base that way. So I uh, uh, went through a lot, but that was years ago. I'm, I'm happy now. I'm content. And I live in the part of the country that um, works for me. It does. I'm, I've been in the South for 30 years. I'm from New York. I, I was not a Southern boy, as they say. And um, anything above 75 degrees starts to annoy me. So I'm really in the right part of the country. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to hear. So there is life outside of the church. Oh, there is. There is. And it takes time. You know, it's not a, oh, well, a kind of an attitude. Uh, you know, you have your heart into it. I was very sincere. You couldn't talk me out of it back when I was stuck in the middle of it. But um, now I look back and you know, the, the, the concept, it always comes up, you know, why was I so stupid? Why was I so naive? Why did I put up with that so long? Um, and, and that rectifies itself. Uh, I don't feel that way anymore. I, I could be self-critical, angry at myself. Um, I don't think I ever got angry at God because I had studied myself out of that. To me, that would be like getting angry at the witch in Hansel and Gretel. It, it was irrelevant to my um, um, understanding of, of theology that I outgrew uh, because of the experience. So, yeah, I'm doing fine. Uh, I don't need to be liked. You know, that's one of the things I always needed to be liked. When you step outside the church and then you participate publicly, you know, on church uh, blogs and so on, and you get nailed big time. Um, get called a lot of names and I've learned I don't care. I don't care what anybody thinks about me, but I would like to be understood and have the opportunity to be understood. And so I feel like this has been helpful for me too. But I'm, I'm, I'm past the stage that Mark is in, but I also know, Mark, what's coming for you. <laughs> what, you're a prophet now too? I am, <laughs> I am. <laughs> well, Mark, I'm curious, what has the reaction been since we have started this series? I know that you don't physically have family in Restored Church of God, mm -hmm. but you still mm -hmm. have friends and friends on the outside that used to be there. How has the reaction of the shows been for you, Mark? The, the reactions have been mostly positive, not entirely uh, my own, which I was told about this. You know, when you're in a church of God, you're also told, oh, your family and friends will welcome you back with open arms back into the devil's world. And in a way, that's absolutely true in that my parents were very relieved when I left. And my friends were like, oh, we're so glad you're, you're over that. And, you know, they want to check in how you're doing. I've had strangers write to me and make sure, hey, if you need a fellowship, you can come to our church. The folks here in Wadsworth, I've gotten private messages from people that have been very, you know, supportive of like, hey, I'm sure this is really hard for you, but hang in there. I'll pray for you. So there's there's been a lot of positive support. Uh, one comment I'd like to make about the last topic, though, about leaving is, is letting anybody who's in a church of God that they've proven from their Bibles that it's not the right place, that their leader is false, or that the doctrines are not matching what the Bible says. It is not easy to leave a church of God. It's not easy to relieve, leave any kind of religion, and you should not expect it to be easy emotionally, physically, financially, in a, on a marriage, on a relationship, especially if you have kids. It's really hard for children to do that. But you have to count the cost, you know, like when you came in to the church, you kind of have to count the cost of leaving. And I would say that regardless of, you know, not having a work, not having a, a job right now, I'm not married, I have no kids. I never once, not even once thought, hmm, I wonder if I made the right decision, maybe I should have stayed. That has never in over, you know, almost 15 months now ever come to mind as far as a thought or 
a regret. And I don't know if Dennis had any thoughts or regrets after he left, but that gives me a great comfort that I made the right decision, that I knew what I was doing was right. And, you know, even what they're teaching today proves I couldn't have stayed with what is continuing here 15 months later. But overall, the reaction has been nice. There have been a couple of people that have um, told me that I'm not, I don't represent them. I'm not. I'm whitewashing some of the things that I pointed out um, that I'm not telling the full truth, the full story. You're not this and that and the other, you, and you're never going to please everybody. And I've never claimed to be omniscient. I've never claimed that I know everything and everybody experiences everything I do. And I would never say that because there are people that have had far worse experiences than I, than I have, but it's up to those people to tell their stories and come forward if they want that story told. I can't do it all. So to make it clear, and, and I know, but for the audience, you only speak of things that you have personally witnessed or somebody close to you personally witnessed and you can contest to that. You're not going to go off and tell a story from, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend. You are just speaking close to. That way you're, you're authentic. I'm trying to be as truthful and honest as I can, because the last thing I would want, I mean, when you, when you stand up against a minister, you know, a minister of Jesus Christ or his true church, the last thing you ever want to do is have lies on your side, to have exaggerations, to have falsehoods that could be proven false because it discredits everything you say or do. And I've tried really, really hard to be very careful to never say anything that's not true so that the minister sitting in the room on the third floor here in Wadsworth can say, well, Mark's a liar. Look what he's doing. The devil's working with him. Look at this. It's really important to me that, that I be truthful. And so I can only tell stories that I can verify either with my own eyes and ears or somebody that I consider a very good friend. And I'm taking their word for it that something was said or done. But even then, I try to only do it in small doses. But yes, thank you for bringing that up. So going into that, um, what about the negative reactions? Um, those that have said that you haven't said the full truth, why aren't you talking about the full truth? I can personally say that I have had some inboxes from people saying that we are not displaying the full truth. And to make it clear, we are only going off like Mark said, based on close personal experiences and truth that we can absolutely verify. So if you say the sun is blue, but you see, you know, somebody says that it's red, well, no, we, we are trying to stick as close as we can. So Mark, how have those reactions been for you, especially when some people feel that you need to apologize or take back some things that you said? Yes. Because I'm not om omniscient and I don't know everything and I don't know what happened behind closed doors, I can only speak to what I know. And when people are upset about something I said, the, oh, you said this or you said that, or I, I gave my opinions once in a while, like I said, um, and the thing of contention that I know has been for other people is that it, I felt it was cowardly for people to come forward and complain anonymously. And I listened, I, somebody wrote me, somebody I actually knew that I knew in the church. And um, I went back and listened to what I said to see like, oh, did I cross a line? Did I say something that I, I need to go back and apologize for? And I, I can't, I can't. That was, that was not a declaration from on high that everybody who speaks anonymously is quote, a coward. I just always felt it was kind of, mm, kind of cowardly to, to do that. Why don't you just put your name and face on there? But you know, I can't apologize for that. And I won't apologize for that. And if that offends some people, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm not trying to offend them. And I understand I have very close friends who are giving me attaboys privately about what I'm doing. And then when I ask them, hey, would you like to talk to Dawn on camera? Oh, no, no, no. I don't, I'm, now's not a good time for that. Or, oh, no, you know, and they have reasons. They have their wives and kids and their jobs to consider. And, you know, I understand and respect that. But it it kind of makes me be out there by myself as the useful idiot, the one who's too stupid to know he's about to get his head chopped off when he puts it through the wall. And 
I'm kind of willing to accept that just because of my situation. Again, I don't have much to lose. And so I'm willing to take the risk to speak the truth as honestly as I can, and maybe speak for people that can't speak for themselves or don't feel comfortable speaking for themselves. So I would encourage anyone who wants to, who wants to come forward, who wants to tell their story. I know that you, Don, have even said that you're willing to report what people say or talk to them and keep them anonymous. I think it would be so wonderful if other people from other churches of God, former ministers, former members, not just RCG, would come forward and tell their stories. Don will keep you anonymous and you can still have your voice be heard. And I think that, you know, Dennis has been doing this for a long time, so it's kind of old hat for him to kind of speak where others didn't feel comfortable coming forward speaking. I know, Mark, that uh, some people that you have talked to don't understand fully why you're doing this. It's And and then those that aren't even ever have been in the church are like, what's the big deal? People leave a church all the time mm-hmm. or feel that it is beating a dead horse. <laughs> why are you doing this? What What is your reasoning? You know, I've given that a lot of thought, like what my motivation and what my end goal is. Uh, I don't have hate for the people of the Restored Church of God. I don't have hate for David C. Pack, and I don't want to hurt him, you know, emotionally or whatever. But I do feel like it's, I was on a ship that's sinking. It's heading towards the iceberg. It's not going to change course. And I feel the need to at least say to everyone, hey, I was on that ship. It's not going in the right direction and kind of warn people warn people either who are considering the restore church of God who are still in restore church of God. It's like, I, I feel like I have to say something and considering I don't have a job right now. I've got a lot of time. I got a lot of time on my hands. So I hope Dave pack prays that I get a job because otherwise I'm able to spend the time and the energy to write articles, to give interviews and just discuss you know, my experiences and kind of let people know, hey, this is what I see is going on. This is what I say is going on. And if somebody wants to point out something that I've said or done that is wrong, that is not factually correct, that is inaccurate, I would love for them to point it out for me so I can correct it. I would like to say uh, one of the main reasons, and I've wanted to do this series for a very long time, but I didn't feel that it was appropriate unless I, I had somebody that was on the inside so I wouldn't speak false. Um, My reasoning for continuing this is for those that are on the inside who are looking to possibly leave, those who are on the outside who are still having a hard time. I, I have noticed a lot of former members have shut themselves down and when something is slightly open for them, the floodgates start coming and I know you, Dennis, as well, you guys have been amazing talking to people, you know, explaining things. I'm doing this series for education purposes because uh, many citizens around the church, um, even to the outside, have so many speculations. But one of the main things is, for me, is the, again, we are not going against David C. Pack. He is more than welcome. I've invited to participate in an interview, Uh, but the practices that are being done is something that we have an issue with, as in the practice of common that's not practiced anymore in Worldwide Church of God or any of the splinters except for Restored Church of God and people bleeding financially dry to the being the false prophet constantly giving dates and seeing what it does to people i've seen what it's done to you i've seen what it's done to dennis uh other former members and it absolutely breaks my heart for somebody that's just wanting to go do the right thing and honor god end up coming out a blithering mess Thanks. I'm a blithering mess. That's good to know. Well, you know what I'm talking about in regards to talking Dennis to is decades former members, past that. You have handled it very well, but there are ones that don't. We have encountered several former members who who are on one scale to the next because they haven't 
they just wanted to bury it. And I completely understand, you know, when you don't want to deal, you just want to bury it and forget about it. But unfortunately, it's always there. It's always going to come back. And I would like to say to those that haven't talked to Dennis or Mark, I can contest. They, they have been really good just talking things out with people. They're not here to bash anyone. They're just here to get the truth out and walk through it. Now, going into the blog site, I've noticed, Mark, that you've been participating in a blog site called Banned by HWA. And what are you writing about? Well, actually, that's how Dennis and I came in contact with each other because I had been reading that website for years, and I know Dennis was a contributor long and i don't, and he actually could probably give you the story of the origins of that blog and how he he came to write there because i think it's kind of interesting um i saw it as an outlet to be able to at first it was just i was commenting in the comment section i was not intending any of my anything that i would say or write to ever be splashed on the front page but then i started writing things that i would you know, refresh the page and suddenly it's in the headline and on the front page. And it was like, whoa, I wasn't, I wasn't quite expecting that. But what I realized was that I kind of had a natural creative talent to be able to write things both that are factual, but then also sometimes have an angle of humor or satire to kind of lighten it a little bit and make it interesting for people to read and learn about. And everything that I've written there, I've basically been reporting about what's been going on inside the Restore Church of God. Sometimes one of the articles I wrote was basically just quoting his own book at him, where a book from 2012 condemned what he's doing and saying today. And sometimes words are very powerful. And I feel very privileged that the folks at HWA website saw value in what I was writing. And so now it's, I've gotten into a normal rhythm. And I think I was, I was told by the, the man who runs the site, anytime you write something, I'll post it. So that kind of gave me some encouragement to go ahead and keep writing and keep reporting what I'm seeing and hearing. A lot of times it's just direct quotes with some fun or quippy, you know, an angle of humor and that kind of thing. And if people go to the website, I've actually, I'm not being sued by them. That I even, Dennis, wanted to tell me don't use satire on that website and i kind of went ahead and wanted to do it anyways and i had so many people write to me and say hey we want to start a gofundme if you've got law or uh, legal fees and i'm like i had to pump the brakes real fast and put a disclaimer in that so i have to be careful what i say and do because now more eyes are on it and i have to be careful of the angle at which i use because i don't want and dennis's point because i counseled with him on the phone about it I don't want the humor for everything in the article to be seen as humor because if they see the quotes from David C. Pack and think that that's humor, then it defeats the whole purpose. It's like, no, that's absolutely 100% verified, real, and true. So the, the blog for me has kind of been an outlet to go through my process because I, I didn't say or do anything for an entire year. I didn't even listen to a Dave Pack sermon for over a year after I left Restored Church of God. And then somebody started sending them to me on their own. I didn't ask for them. And then I started listening. I'm like, wow, he's doing the same stuff over and over again. So I felt like it's that website is an avenue for people who have left worldwide or uh, another cog or thinking about it. It's a resource where they can, you know, see different opinions and ideas from other folks. And I'm sure Dennis has a lot more to say about that website. Dennis, what what did you specifically write about on the website? Well, I'm I wrote on that site years ago to process my experience to help me get some feedback um, to put it in a place where I could live with it and uh, maybe get some support um, from people who are going through the same thing. What I found was that I'm the only minister from the Worldwide Church of God that I know of who uses my own name, my own picture, this is who I am, this is where I pastored. Everything else is anonymous on that site, so I don't really know who's watching, but, but initially it was to process my own experience. Gradually, as that began to become less or more and more unnecessary, um, I began to write on topics that I was never taught at Ambassador College. My education, theology education at Ambassador College was shallow and, and weak. 
And uh, I've always been interested in theology, you know, where the Bible come from, who wrote it, who didn't, and all of that. Um, and I began to write about those topics thinking, well, I find this interesting. Don't you find it interesting? And that's when the name calling started. You know, there's a term that's been used on that site that I'm a ministerd. I'm one of those ministerds. Um, <laughs> and I've gotten used to that. I've, I was called the high priest of Marduk, um, which is a pagan god. And so one of the phenomenon that I found there was the more I spoke about topics that were of interest and I thought would be interesting, um, anonymous people would project upon me their experiences with their own minister. So because their minister wasn't available or there wasn't the person who actually hurt them available, they just projected it onto me. So I lived in an ivory tower. I caused all these problems. You ministers are all alike. They taught you at Ambassador College to be like this. All of that is just baloney for me personally. Um, I'm very easy to talk to. Even when I was a church pastor, people would tell me things that I know they wouldn't tell previous pastors because it was safe to talk to me. And uh, uh, so now I write there a lot less. I participate a lot less because I processed it. I want to simply be helpful. That's why I appreciate this venue. I've had an experience. I had that experience as both a member and a minister. So how can I help those who are going through the same process years later than I experienced? Um, but the experience is always the same. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. When you come out of a cultish experience, it doesn't matter if it's um, a diet industry that became a cult or uh, some other kind of topic, non-religious, that was a cult. The experience is the same. The, motion, the emotions are the same. The results can be the same. Um, so I just want to be helpful. You know, like I say, my theme is if I'm going to have this ridiculous experience, I may as well, might as well share what I've learned from it. Somebody once told me, you know, and they believed in reincarnation. They said, you know, before we incarnate, we actually sit down and write our own script of the life we want to live in our next life. And I said, really, um, the next time I write this script, I would like to make a rule there be no drinking because I had to be drunk to write this story. <laughs> I would rather be a paleontologist. I'll tell you that right now. I'd rather be a paleontologist, but it isn't going to happen. So uh, I just want to be helpful. That is good. Mark, what, what's your goal with writing on this site? I, I, I find it to be more cathartic than anything else, considering that I have the time and the kind of creative uh, inspiration to tackle it. I don't wake up in the mornings thinking I'm going to write an article until somebody sends me a sermon. Like even today, I was not planning on writing anything. I was going to get up and drink my coffee and do whatever I was going to do. And then somebody sent me a sermon that, you know, Dave Pack is now reiterating the fact that he has been Elijah the prophet for however long, and he's not sure and not sure about this and that, but he definitely is. Again, it's, it's more about the causing awareness. It's about you know, I care about the people in the restored church of God. I mean, I even like the ministers. There's some really nice ministers over there who might see me as, you know, Satan, the devil got me and I'm, I am an enemy of the church and I want to murder them. I don't feel that way. I care about these people. And if it takes a voice that they are familiar with to point out things that they already know in a way that maybe they hadn't thought about before, that kind of keeps me going. And I've, kind of this whole process has created its own momentum this was not something i planned on doing this was not something that i was seeking out like even you reaching out to me uh, off off of facebook i didn't come out and say hey i have a story to tell do you want to put me on camera you approached me and it just seemed like the right time and so writing on the blog has also been the right time and i have the time to do it i have the energy to do it and dave pack has no shortage of material for me to cover or to satire or to poke fun at, or basically just to quote Bible verses against what he says and let the readers decide whether or not he's false or not. So this is part of my process. Maybe deep, 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 deep down, I'm bitter and angry, but I don't feel that way. I, I really don't. Even with talking, Dennis and I have talked for hours. I don't get worked up. I can talk about something passionately, but I don't have a deep anger and bitterness about all the money I gave and the time I gave. 
I loved working at the Restored Church of God. It was a wonderful, beautiful place to work. I appreciated the people I was with. I had wonderful conversations with so many nice people. And all that is gone now. And here I am still living in Wadsworth. I go to the Giant Eagle right across the street. I see people on mowers. I'm like, oh, I know that guy. And I know that guy. And oh, those kids are still working there. You know, it's, it's just part of a process. And I don't know when it's going to be over. If I slip on a banana peel on the sidewalk, then people can say, aha, God was punishing him by putting that banana peel on the sidewalk. But, you know, what happens from here going out, I can't say no. What have the reactions been for your writings? Uh, the people on the website, as Dennis can attest to, because they're anonymous, can very freely speak what they would never say to another human being face to face. <laughs> And I, I, I've actually read some things of, of people going after uh, uh, Dennis on, online. And I, you know, I feel bad for the people even, hey, Anonymous at 317, you said this, you know, you're a jerk and blah, 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 and, and that kind of stuff. And it, it almost like devolves into to name calling at some point uh, among some people. And you can't tell who, who people are. Um, but I would say overall, the, the reaction has been positive. There have been a couple of critics. And I even had somebody who called me to the carpet about what I was doing. And we eventually got on the phone and, and talked about it. And I was willing to like, let me hear you out. If you have a different perspective, because I don't know everything and you think I'm out of line, then, you know, tell me I'm out of line. And I had, I had somebody on the phone point out that a couple of the things I said seemed like I was hitting below the belt. And that gave me pause. I'm like, wow, I never, I never considered that Dave Pack could be, you know, affected one way or the other by anything I would say or do. It just didn't cross my mind. I wasn't even sure if it would reach his ears. I know as people would, or, you know, the RCG ministers, they, they're all over the website. They monitor everything, they monitor Facebook, they monitor the websites. They're always keeping and then in, in reporting to Dave Pack. So overall, the, the response has been good, but even when it's criticism or negative, then I try to, I try to balance what would be the appropriate human thing to do? Some people you just don't react to at all. And other people you answer them and try to explain, look, if I, you know, and apologize where necessary. Now, I know you've been asked this and I've seen comments on different medias. Why don't you just stop? Why don't you just move on with your life? This is part of the process of me moving on with my life. And I'd be curious to know from Dennis, like how long it took him for before he felt after he left his life got, you know, quote, back to normal. But this is still going on. If this was something that, you know, OK, like in Dennis's case, Herbert W. Armstrong died. That ended his era. And then a couple of guys came in, changed some things. And then that entity died. So it was a finite there was an end to what happened. Now, yes, it still carries on today. There are still echoes of that from other people who tried to pick up the mantle, but differently, David C. Pack is still preaching today the very things that caused me to leave 15 months ago that he was preaching five years before that. So it's kind of continuing. And so until I find a job and find a wife and spend my time doing something else, I've got nothing else better to do. <laughs> Dennis, what has the reaction been for you participating in this? You know, not much because I don't have contacts um, outside of, um, I really don't have a lot of contacts. Um, I've kind of gotten any reactions that Mark has got uh, is sort of passed on to me. I have posted uh, our discussions on my alumni board, the Ambassador College Alumni Board. Um, not many comments there. I think it intimidates. I think it reminds a lot of people too much of what they've been through. I personally think there's a lot of denial. You know, they don't want to talk about it. They've moved on. They do other things. There's a lot of former ministers on the alumni board who say nothing, absolutely nothing. I have no clue what they're thinking. Um, so I don't, I don't get a lot of reactions because I'm not in the, the loop that would provide them. Um, you know, as far as moving on, or why don't you, why don't you move on? Uh, I have moved on, and when I listen to Mark, what I see is myself, ten or twelve, maybe fifteen years ago. So he's right where he belongs for the amount of time that uh, he's 
left that experience. And, um, you know, Mark, I'm your future. <laughs> That's scary, Dennis. That really scary. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, uh, you brought up things about the fence and the horses being purchased by Restored Church of God, um, and that it's not illegal, then why even mention it? Yeah, somebody uh, called me out on that, too. Like, why do you keep bringing up horses and, and fences? You know, what do you care? And blah, blah, blah. Well, my, my, my major point of bringing those things up is, is that the common doctrine, which is that people for people who don't know who that is, what, it, that, what that is in the Restored Church of God, David Pack teaches that you give all your assets as much as you can possibly spare to the church and to the work. And a lot of times it's very urgent and your salvation depends on it. When people give, when they sacrifice, when they do fundraisers, garage sales, they sell clothes, they sell trinkets, uh, you know, uh, you know, elderly senior ladies will knit and sell little doilies when they're trying to send in their widow's mites, all those people are giving money to the restored church of God so that they can fulfill the commission that Jesus Christ gave them, which is to preach the gospel. The fence, the fence and the horses in particular. And again, I don't know if Dave Pack wrote a check for the horse. I don't know if he did that. If he did, then I would say, you know what? I would eat my hat on that one. So, because, you know, he did the right thing. However, if some federal agency, IRS or state of Ohio tax board or somebody did an audit and found out who actually paid for the horses and then come to find out that it came out of the general fund of the Restored Church of God, people don't give money to the Restored Church of God in hopes of them buying a horse and buying fences. That is not the purpose for common. That is not the purpose for your tithes and offerings. They seem to think they have a blank check when, well, it comes into God's church and we get to decide how it's used. It's like, okay, you're supposed to be a wide steward, a wise steward with those funds. Fine. You know, I would tremble before God if I had to explain at the judgment seat of Christ why I took widow's mites and the woman who like sacrificed and stayed up late and then did all this work to send in her money for it to go into a horse. That's not the purpose. So I call those things out because it seems wrong to me to spend the money on those types of things that are unnecessary and that don't preach the gospel. And if I find out there's some other kind of crazy expense, which I always thought the, the trees were like, man, don't we have enough trees on this campus? You know, that was kind of extravagant, I thought, but that, you know, what, what God is going to judge, that's up between him and Dave Pack. But I'll keep bringing it up and let people know, hey, your money that you are sending in to the Restored Church of God, people out in the world who want to donate and give to this wonderful church, you might be buying farm animals. Now, if we can back up a little bit, um, you previously talked about a fundraiser, which I think is what sparked a lot of this. In regards to a fundraiser, that funds were raised and never spent on what they were supposed to be spent on. And further looking into it, you found out that there was technically a roundabout way that they could still use that money. What you're referring to is that the Ambassador Youth Camp of 2020 raised over $100,000 of donations from members in the church to help fund the camp. They do that every year. Well, in 2020, due to COVID, they had no camp. That money was never returned to the people who donated it for. And from my understanding of the way the money worked, they also did not use it to fund the 2021 camp because they went and did fundraising for the 2021 camp. And my question was always, well, where did that $100,000 go? And the only the people that know are the people that can do the audit. So where that money went, I don't know if this gets into a violation of my um, non-disclosure agreement, but this is information I didn't have when I was an employee, but it's still a how-to. There is a legal way, and accountants and, and tax lawyers know, there is a legal way for all nonprofits, not just the Restore Church of God, every 501c3 organization can do this, where you can have a fundraiser for a specific purpose, not spend the funds on that event, and at the end of the fiscal year, then use that money for whatever you want after the year rolls. So I guess that's not 
uh, propriety to the Restored Church of God and how they do things, but that's a way that all nonprofits can actually take money in and spend it however they want. It just boggles me because it seems that the horses are on the property, but yet you mentioned none of the ministers or most of the people own animals because it was thought to be a waste of money that you could give to the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, none of the ministers at headquarters have pets. Absolutely not. Dave Pack has preached from the pulpit. He doesn't believe that any member should have pets either, but he doesn't hand it down as a command. The ministers don't enforce that. It's just you know frowned upon. But none of the ministers, to my knowledge, at headquarters have any pets because I think Dave Pack would have a fit about what a terrible example they are to the brethren. You're wasting your time and your money. You're wasting your money on that animal when you could be giving it to the work. So why he can then turn around and have horses, you would have to ask him how those two things, you know, align with each other. I know we talked about, well... It doesn't seem like the funds are like, an example, the mega church in Texas, where they go on all these flights and all these vacations. So then where does the money go? And you mentioned the maintenance of the property. Oh, sure. Yeah. With, without common, there's no campus. The campus has the mortgage on the buildings, on the property. I mean, I don't know how the finances work with the trees. Uh, all the land that landscaping is very very expensive it's a beautiful multi-hundred acre campus it's well maintained people who drive by the even in wadsworth they hate the church they go wow that's a really nice lawn those trees are really nice they keep it pristine it's a beautiful place the whole campus is just beautiful and gorgeous the lakes i mean there's videos on youtube and the uh, rcg YouTube page, if people are curious, they can go to the RCG website, rcg.org, or they can go to their YouTube page and see the beauty and the quality of the campus. And all that upkeep takes money to do it. Tithes and offerings with, you know, 1500 plus or minus baptized members will not pay for the campus. The campus is paid for the houses they purchase along Highway 261. That's all common. Now, there are banks involved and bank loans involved, but you have to have a considerable amount of assets and show that your income on the books for the banks to continue to loan you money for another property and loan you from another property and loan you, you know, and then you've got all these mortgages and all these homes that people are paying rent. So I'm sure that offsets those, those mortgages, but nobody's paying rent on the big buildings. And one of them is basically a relic now because they don't even use the building for in which it was built which is the media center that was supposed to be the studio for the world to come program that dave pack hasn't recorded in about five years so what's the purpose for that building other than to be a museum now but that might you know whether stuff is paid off i don't know how their financials work but i'm sure that they you know keep refinancing but anyways your question common pays for the campus and without common there is no campus if i, I know you know that Go ahead. If I might interject here, um, for those listening who might like to understand how Mr. Pack thinks about the finances of the membership, um, just go online and look up the clarion call, David C. Pack, and just read the sermon that he gave, telling people what he expected of them in giving common, in giving uh, their homes, mortgages, wills. Um, it is astounding. Uh, to read the words as uh, of what is expected and how it's expected and by what authority he expects it to be sent in. Um, so I was just referring you to the clarion call by David C. Pack, and you might find my article on it or you might find the original, um, but just read that and you'll really understand uh, how this comes about and the fear um, that's put into the minds of the members uh, to give in my mind, that which nobody has to give. I also wonder how many times can you give everything once? And that was a number of years ago. But every time come back, give more, give more, give more. I don't see how there's any more to give. And I have been told behind the scenes that, as Mark said, the income basically goes to help that campus survive. Um, they're not in as good a position, from what I understand, as that might make you feel that they are. 
uh, that's an incredible financial drain on the church. And uh, as far as, you know, at church preaching the gospel, I'd say that's come to a screeching halt. And I think, you know, Mark has indicated that. So uh, the clarion call online, um, you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. I'll make sure I get that link and I attach it with the video. Now, Mark, to clarify, common that is required to be a member of the church, uh, Restored Church of God. It's required for salvation is the way it's taught and where pressure is applied to people. It is not just required as a member. Oh, it's absolutely required as a member. But the way it's taught is that you will not make it to the kingdom unless you sell all. If you go through the book of Acts, that's not how common was used at the time. And that's not the way the phrase was used at the time. It was to distribute to anyone who had need. It was for the individuals and the people that didn't have very much. They were a new church that was just being put together. So the people that were rich that came into the church were helping the people that weren't to get the church established. It was not, it was not written as a permanent forever until you know the kingdom comes that this is an institution of God for a new financial structure. That's just not the way it is. However, Dave Pack is very masterful you know, I often say he's like a street magician with the sleight of hand where he can reshuffle verses to make them say whatever he wants. I mean, there are, you know, you could say, you know, Catholic and Protestant denominations who like to t cherry pick their, their verses and put them together and say, this is a doctrine that we only we teach because of these verses. Dave Pack is very masterful at that in taking a lot of verses and just drowning you with information to where you can't even absorb it anymore. And but then hammer it that this is the way it is. And on God's authority, I tell you, this is the way it is. And that's what the way he'll do it, too. He will speak very loudly, very forcefully and tell you on God's authority. Now, I used to shudder in my chair when I would hear that as a member, because we're not to take the Lord's name in vain. If any man claims God's authority when God did not give him that authority, and he's preaching something God did not want taught, that man has a day of reckoning coming, and he will answer for his words. All throughout the Old Testament, and sometimes in the New Testament, people who, who speak falsely in God's name, it doesn't end well for them. And so I, would, I actually prayed for him while I was a member that this was true, and that he was not doing that not speaking in vain. And ultimately we'll find out when the kingdom gets here, when Jesus Christ gets here and pulls me aside and say, Hey, Mark, you know, you were wrong about this. Or he has to pull him aside and say, Hey, Dave, I know you really tried, but this is what you got wrong. I don't know. I just know that the common has hurt a lot of people. I was into it. I gave fully. I have no retirement because of it. I gave a lot of, you know, money that I could have put into savings and had for a future, but I, I believed it. And I believed Dave Pack. And that's Didn't where you have to repaint made. your truck. Is it? Oh, that's, I was, I have a yellow Chevy S 10 pickup. When I came out here from California, I'll try to keep this brief. And uh, it, two ministers approached me separately saying, you know, Mark, you know, don't you think yellow is kind of a loud color for a truck? <laughs> And at the time I was like, oh, you know, I want to be, I just came here to headquarters. I'm a go-getter. I'll do whatever. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so I volunteered to paint my truck and I, you know, wound up spending $2,500 that I didn't have. I had to go into credit card debt to paint my truck. And then only to find out years later, and this speaks to the people inside the Restored Church of God who enabled David C. Pack. Dave Pack, is a, this is the story I was told by a minister who, who actually asked me to do this years later. You know, Dave Pack was up in his office. He looked out the window and said, whose yellow truck is that? Like he was disgusted by it. And so the minister who heard it took it upon himself like, oh, this is a problem. We got to rectify it. He didn't say that Dave Pack said, hey, go tell him not to do that. But this man took it upon himself. And to go and approach me and say, hey, Mark, you know, is yellow a good color for your truck? And that is painting my truck is the only regret. I have in the restored church of God, where I actually did something which I didn't feel was right, but I wanted to do it. I wanted to show that I was serious. And one of the things I wish I hadn't done. Now, I know you made a comment. We'll, we'll talk about this just real quick before we move on. You made a comment that there was uh, another church 
that has a jet or a plane mm -hmm. while David Pack just has horses. Just, well, he has a campus and a horse and a nice house. And uh, Dennis, I'm referring to Philadelphia and maybe you might have more backstory on, on that than I do. But the Philadelphia Church of God run by Gerald Flurry, who was another false apostle, false prophet, another fake fat prophet. They have a campus in Oklahoma and he actually has a private jet. Now, if Dave Pack actually bought a private jet, I think people would have a conniption uh, because he doesn't need it. He never leaves the campus anyways. He, he loves to brag about how he has left the camp campus in months, uh, but apparently Gerald Flurry needs it to, to fly around the world. I don't know. Dennis, do you have anything to add about Gerald Flurry in Philadelphia? Church well, he, he bought the jet because he is mimicking uh, Herbert Armstrong's world girdling trips, at least in his mind. Uh, they bought a, a, a Gulfstream 2 or 3 or 4, whichever one there are, a million dollars jets, millions of dollars to maintain. Uh, he, he has, uh, Gerald Flurry has a belief that he's going to find the Ark of the Covenant in uh, Ireland, so he goes to Ireland. Um, I'm not totally familiar with it all, but I know that uh, it's a very expensive proposition. Uh, his campus looks a lot like Mr. Pack's campus. They've kind of copied each other, and both of those campuses are, are takeoffs on the Ambassador College campus. So both of these men have kind of been infected um, by the same copy uh, Herbert Armstrong as much as you can and, and get as much out of that copying as possible. Uh, I can't see why Dave would buy a jet because he has no place to go. So, um, but Gerald Flurry has found places to go. He'll go to Jerusalem. He will do a lot. Herbert Armstrong used to do, draw, uh, fly all over the world and, uh, you know, hope somebody will notice him. It's very expensive. Does he now have Mark, this line that flies behind the tail like you'd see on a, on a car that's a, you know, car sale? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, Mark, you made a comment on a blog this past week in regards to saying that David Pack is not a monster, and you got some pretty strong reactions. Could you talk about that? Yes, and... and you know, in, in the, the blogging and trying to be as truthful and honest as I can and, you know, answering rumors I've often accused as being a shill or a mole or, oh, you're supporting RCG by what you're saying. I think a truly balanced person on any argument should be able to see both sides of it and call a spade a spade. When something is not true, I say it's not true. And when something is completely, you know, when something is true, I say that it is. So, my, my point of in the blog was that, you know, I've seen, I had, a, I actually shared a very warm story about Dave Pack that I witnessed at headquarters. He, it was a very human and sweet moment where he stopped a meeting because a little kid wanted to hug him and he picked up the kid and hugged the kid. And, you know, he stopped the meeting in front of all these ministers. And I happened to see this. I'm like, wow, that's really sweet. Dave Pack loves kids. You know, he's not a monster. Well, that set some people off. Like, how can you say that? You know, Stalin loved kids and Hitler was kissing babies. And it's like, <laughs> whenever you start, whenever you yep. start comparing people to Hitler, Nazis, or calling people racist to me, I feel like you're really undercutting your own argument. And so I basically said, look, I stand by that. I personally don't believe Dave Pack is a monster. I don't think he's an awful human being. I don't have personal horror stories about Dave Pack. Again, I am not omniscient. I had my experience with him. And some people would say all the bad things that they could say about the man and did have closed door experiences that would cause your, you know, your toes to curl if you heard it or your, your hair to stand on it. But I don't tell those stories because I don't have it. And so I feel it's really important that when you say you can say something nice about somebody you're criticizing because you're also criticizing, you know, his words. I attack and I satirize, and I report Dave Pack's words, his actions, and the, the result of the pain that he causes people. I don't attack him personally. I don't have a beef with the guy personally. He was always nice to me. I said this in another interview. I don't have terrible Dave Pack stories. And so, therefore, I'm kind of telling people, hey, you know, I don't think he's a monster. Now, one thing I will say that's a caveat to all that is I do have one story that speaks to the man, speaks to his character, and speaks to the people around him and how he has trained them. I'm sure Herbert Armstrong did the same thing as when you, you can't control everything when you have this giant machine spread all over the world, you can't keep track of every detail. 
However, if you train people to speak in your way and to think in your way, that people will take care of things that you would have taken care of the same way. There was a man who was a, a voiceover artist that was literally the voice of World to Come. If you watch any World to Come starting from 2012 on, his name was Alan, just this really great guy, voiceover talent. He was, you know, a paid voiceover actor that we paid for and we had a good relationship with him. He was the voice of behind the work up until the last one. And so Alan had to stop working with us when I was in the media production services department because he was he had cancer. He had pancreatic cancer and he was in the hospital and he was going to die. And so in the office, we started a greeting card, a get well card. Hey, you know, please get well, Alan. Well, I approached a senior minister at headquarters and said, it would be really great if Dave, you know, Mr. Pack could just sign a couple of words. It'll make all the difference in the world to just sign this card. The man's dying in the hospital. He's been a great, you know, asset to the church for years and years, you know, just, you know, spend 20, 30 seconds just to write something. Well, I get the card back about two weeks, two days later. Mrs. Pack wrote a very wonderful and sweet and thoughtful, like she took up practically half the card with her comments. And she was very supportive. Uh, the senior man that I had given the card to himself, he signed it. Thank you so much for your service and your help. But I noticed Dave Pack did not sign the card. Now, did Dave Pack create a law in the Restored Church of God that if anybody's dying of cancer, don't give me the card because I don't want to sign it? I don't believe that's the case. However, I think that he's trained people enough to know, don't bug Mr. Pack with these types of things. Let his wife or other men take care of it. And that was really disappointing to me. That felt like, how is that Christian? The man couldn't spend 20 seconds, 30 seconds to say, you know, hey, I'm sorry, you've been a great asset to the work and sign his name. That's it. That's all he had to do. And he didn't do it. Now, whether they never presented it to him or he said no, I don't know. But I know that the result is the same, is the man who died of cancer a week later got that card. I mean, his, his wife told me that he got the card before he died. He got the card the, before he died, and Dave Pack's name wasn't on it. And I felt, this is wrong. And this was, you know, <laughs> close to before I decided to leave. It was like, this is the, the kind of place that's being run by a person that would do that or train other people to keep him from having to deal with that. I thought it was just, it was wrong. And that's something I would like to talk with Dave Pack about ever. Did you know about the card? Did you know? And why didn't you sign it if you did know? Why, why couldn't you just spend 30 seconds? Like that's, that's the one question I would have for Dave Pack personally if I ever saw him again. So we're just gonna clarify that when people hear this and get upset you're specifically stating listen i don't have any of the horror stories that other people do i'm not saying that they probably don't exist i'm just speaking on my experience and that's where we'll leave it now to wrap up I've heard that David C. Pack is still doing it, still setting dates <laughs> that are coming and going. Just yesterday explained how he's a prophet and has already been one. What is your take on that, Mark? Uh, well, I just wrote a, a good article for those who are interested on the HWA website that hopefully will be posted today where I take his quotes where he was waffling a couple days ago, and now he's claiming that he is Elijah, which is also that prophet. This is not new information. He taught this years ago, but then he walked, he kind of walked it back over the years. And then within the last couple of months, he's not sure, or it was all told in future tense and future tense in future tense. But now it's past tense, but he doesn't know when it happened. It just happened. And so my article was basically taking scriptures that point out that every prophet of God knows that they're a prophet of God and there's no no room for question about it. And it's interesting, and I'm sure Dennis can speak a little bit to this, that Dave Pack claiming to be Elijah, that prophet, that used to belong, that mantle used to belong to Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong, 
but Dave Pack took it away from him, I believe in 2015 or 2017, I have to go back and look at my notes. He took it away from Mr. Armstrong and, and put that robe upon himself and he's still doing it today. Okay, can we back up just a quick second and explain to those that may have never had a chance to read the Bible, understand the Bible, go to church. Can you please explain the Elijah, the prophet um, that he is giving titles to himself and that basically Herbert Armstrong did? So they kind of understand why this is an issue. I think Dennis should answer that one because he was a minister and in worldwide when that was Mr. Armstrong's deal. Um, I, I don't think Herbert Armstrong took that mantle to himself. I never heard him say, I am the Elijah to come. And that's based on the scripture, um, you know, that Elijah, the prophet, would come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's Malachi. just based on that, that there would be uh, a, a human being in the spirit and power of Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, who would show up just before the coming day of second coming of Jesus. Um, so, and a lot of ministers through the ages, I think, have thought that that was them. I think that's presumptuous. Dave Pack is a master at making the Bible mean what it never meant. He's a master at that. Uh, he's a master at seeing things about himself in the Bible that are not about himself. That's delusional thinking. Um, but he's taken it the next step to where uh, Herbert Armstrong never said, I am the Elijah. There were other ministers that kind of put that bug in his ear. Uh, and think, well, maybe you need to think you are this and okay, but he never said, I never heard it spoken out of his, uh, uh, as, a, as a grand theme of his uh, ministry. I never, you know, some would say, well, you're like Zerubbabel. And I had to look that up and see what's Zerubbabel? <laughs> you know, what did he do? Um, that was put into his mind by others. He didn't claim that. Uh, Herbert Armstrong never claimed to be a prophet. Uh, never. Uh, it was more generic. It was more long-term. Dave has taken all these things to mean him. I am Elijah the prophet. Uh, I am an apostle. Uh, I am uh, uh, the other titles. Mark is more familiar with uh, the restored church and Dave's uh, title taking. Um, there's only one left. Mark and I have kidded about this, but there's only one title left that uh, uh, Mr. Pack can take, and, and that is I am the second coming. Uh, now we kid about that, but I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. So um, that's what the Elijah is, that there would be a character on the scene before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Um, I personally think that's a dangerous thing. Uh, I don't think it's true. I don't think that's going to happen, but that's just where I've come in my theological perspective. But that's in the Bible, and that's, uh, I don't know, is that in Revelation? I've forgotten. In Malachi, um, the book of Malachi. It's in Malachi. Oh, it's Malachi in the Old Testament. It's yeah, in the Old Testament. want to look it up. Yeah, Malachi. so that, that's the basis for it. And I don't think there's any, uh, I think it's delusional thinking and uh, seeing things that aren't there uh, by people who it's not talking about them. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, this has been, again, educational. Uh, we will be continuing these shows. Uh, there's always topics to clarify, topics to always go over. Um, we have been asked, why haven't we covered um, other branches, other religions? Because this show specifically has Dennis and Mark, who can only speak about their experiences. We can't go off and speak about um, other types of churches uh, without having facts and somebody who's been there. So that's why we're sticking with this. Um, again, they aren't speaking for everybody. They're speaking from their personal experiences. And a lot of people have asked why we have not come out and said the word cult and labeled either of these churches or the splinter churches. First off, we are not qualified to do that. Um, second off, it, it's a very broad term. And so what we decided to do um, is start a separate small series in regards to that and have a discussion that goes over the word cult and how uh, different leaders, different people can fall into certain categories. And Dennis and Mark are using Worldwide Church of God and the Restored Church of God and seeing where they kind of might fit in there. But we leave it up to the viewers to go ahead and decide. 
Um, we have more that will build upon that, but that'll give you guys something to go ahead and think about. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to post in comments. Again, till next time, thank you for watching. You are watching WCTV, Wadsworth Community Television.